Hi, everybody. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here visiting you at uh, Cambridge University. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the work I've been doing on uh, precision health and genomics and how it relates to the broader topic of uh, the innovation economy. So um, I'm, I'm really motivated today by the, the book of uh, a Cambridge uh, scholar named uh, Bill Janeway, who, who I think has written just an incredibly important um, piece of scholarship on, on how the state uh, financial investment and the market economy uh, really drive uh, innovation. And, and I want to begin by um, first as a matter of almost motivation and also conflict of interest to say that I've really spent most of my career um, working as an academic, but uh, collaborating and consulting and working uh, with industry, ultimately starting companies and actually investing in companies myself. And I found it just an extraordinarily rewarding part of, of the work that I've done. And one of the things I always became interested in is what makes for these successful companies, why are some able to take on some challenges and not others? And going forward, what would the role of private enterprise be, particularly in the US healthcare system where I operate in, in driving uh, innovation? And so um, the, the framing here is, is really this beautiful book by Bill, and I encourage uh, you, you all to read it. Uh, Bill um, was a, um, just a pioneer in, in financing uh, important uh, speculative ventures, including those in biotechnology. And, and his book just is a treasure trove of, of scholarship and, and, and learning as an active uh, participant and as a, a scholar of, of economics. And so he um, re really sort of sets up for us this idea that um, we need a virtuous cycle of financial incentivization by the state that takes up uh, mostly basic science and, and into translation. And then um, as you've proven out that there's a, a market for this, um, uh, financial speculation begins to take bets and then uh, ideally the best uh, winner wins. Um, and, and, and so that idea, um, has, has really been at the core of the improvement of the human condition over the last 200 years. And, and I really, again, I encourage you to read uh, Bill's book. And, and in my thinking, why I think it is so relevant, particularly in the context of US healthcare, is that I think we really need a massive lift to uh, improve the conditions in, in, in my country. And it requires both uh, private and, and public investment. And, and that's really one of the motivating questions. And, and a lot of this will require, obviously, the building of just massive digital infrastructure for the analysis of healthcare data. And, and that's really at the core of what I'm gonna talk about. So, so the problem I've spent you know, the last 10 years at Stanford, and, and I would say the last 20 years as a scholar thinking about are, how do we really deliver precision health at, at scale for all? How do we use the um, power of statistics and compute married to bio to improve the human condition. And, and in my case, I became first interested in this problem at Cornell in working in agriculture and, and then in human genetics, um, and then really focused on this problem at Stanford, particularly in the problem of diversifying the base in which we make a lot of this research and, and ultimately is the core of, of where this goes. So um, I, I had the privilege of being the chair of a department of biomedical data science at Stanford. And, and the, the reason I had that opportunity was because uh, our dean set out for us a vision of, of creating an institution focused on precision health. And at the medical school, the, the, the logic here was that we have a, a wealth frame that comes from fundamental biological research that leads to transformative platforms that can really improve our care at Stanford and, and ultimately have just, you know, really cascading positive effects. And as we thought about that problem, one of the big issues that, you know, I kept being nagged by is a disproportionate level of chronic disease is found in minority populations. However, the vast majority of genetic studies have been done in populations of, of European descent and, and what problem that may pose for us. As, as we try to diversify the, the base of, of studies. So um, I wrote a piece in 2011 with my colleagues, Francisco de la Vega and Esteban Bouchard that called attention to this issue. It was particularly, it was particularly egregious back then. And, and it's largely that there had been really wonderful investment by Decode and, and by the UK. And so um, uh, you guys were far ahead. And, and most of what we learned about complex disease genetics in the 2000s came from, from those really, really important first investments 
unfortunately, they weren't representative of, of the globe. And so some of us said, we've got to improve this. We've got to build better resources. I would argue it has not moved nearly fast enough. So um, uh, Pope Joy and others in 2016 um, sort of re retook this issue up. There had been improvement largely due to the very logical and necessary investment of China and other countries in genomics. However, when it came to uh, particularly black and Hispanic uh, populations in the United States, massively under uh, represented in this kind of research. So, and why is this a problem? Well, look, first the country as a shifting demographic, um, the, the country will be far more diverse as, as, um, as, as the population shifts. And, and then secondly, the um, translation of biological research takes time. And, and that's part of the argument that Bill Janeway makes, right? If you want to accelerate that, you, you actually can't just rely on government to do it. It won't do it alone. You actually need the three-player game to get this going. So how do we bring the three-player game in, into our field? And I would say my vision is massively open, direct-to-consumer health data being made available for a faster, better, cheaper analysis. And, and that's been at the core of what I've been trying to do for the last five years with a goal of, of fundamentally disrupting the, the healthcare system and, and making this really a, a far more parallelized system where we can allow many others to gain access. And, and, and much of what I'll talk about is actually not even my own research, rather it's my perceptions about where I think the field is going. And, and this is the one thing I've put together that I'm very proud of. I put this a couple of years ago and it's, it's just simply my own schematic about what I view as, as the world of biomedical data science and why it's relevant. And, and I would say that when the Dean asked me to start the department, we were really in this corner. You know, the, the Stanford runs a big hospital system. It's a massive part of what we do as a university. In fact, I, I would argue it's probably the biggest revenue uh, generator for, for the whole university. The, the, we're, we're a hospital with a school attached. And so in this hospital, this school attached, we really care a lot about bringing together electronic health records, dental mix, imaging, pathology, outcomes to improve our own patient care and learn from that. However, we're of course, very focused on our view as, as we would in, in any operation. And, and of course, a lot of what we think about as scholars is the interaction between the healthcare system and the care providers and the drug and insurance world. How much do we pay? Are we doing a good job? I mean, that is the basis of, of, of the, the whole world of healthcare economics. And, and you and Britain have led the way. You've taught us how to do this better than any place in, in the world. However, in the United States, we have a far different healthcare system than you have in, in, in your country. And, and one of the things that in, in particular, I think, gets really missed is that the US healthcare system is not optimized to deliver healthcare. I'm gonna repeat that the US healthcare system is not optimized to deliver healthcare. It is optimized to deliver sick care and it is optimized to deliver acute sick care. And that's very different. Those really are fundamentally different motivating and objective functions. And so if you really wanna promote health, you literally cannot do it from the basis of the sick health system. And, and, and I'm not being, you know, disrespectful, it is literally incentivized for acute care. It is where all the fundamental economics go. And it is where the software that is built goes. So all of the US electronic health record system is around billing. I can tell you exactly how much I pay for every patient down to like 40 or $50. That's actually a question you don't even want to ask in the, in the British healthcare system. You know how much you pay in postage stamps for the entire system, but you don't know how much one person stay at a hospital is. The whole system is incentivized in a completely different way. So if we actually want to incentivize healthcare in our country, we need the consumer and patient data. It is the only way you're actually going to intervene and you actually need to intervene at the point of motivating patients and consumers. There's a whole world of legal and regulatory here that of course is important, but in many ways it just bends and works the space. Data is data and data will be made available. We have to secure it. We have to have protocols that's obvious. We do it in finance all the time. Okay, the whole financial system relies on our ability to secure data. We can of course secure healthcare data. We can of course secure all kinds of data. The question is, how do we make that available and with what purpose? And, and I would argue that the, the future really is in partnerships like we saw several years ago between GlaxoSmithKline and, and um, 23andMe, looking to um, you know, really build a, a powerful network by which they're able to um, 
you know, power the next generation of, of these studies. And, and again, this is from several years ago. These are the reasons that they partnered in a $300 million partnership. You know, really it's about accelerating drug discovery in ways that, that we can make this, this, you know, work. Of course, last week it was announced that 23andMe is now gonna go public led by one of my very, 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 very favorite people, I would say, Richard Branson. I, I, I will say I'm a fanboy of Richard Branson. I've loved the Virgin brand. I've always loved Virgin Atlantic was my favorite airline in the United States. I'm not ashamed to say that. And, and so I actually think it's quite exciting that they, the two of them are partnering on, on this. Um, and, and part of the logic is they're gonna build a subscription health system and that subscription health system will have, you know, just real virtuous cycles working. And, and I really wish them tremendous luck. I, I, I have a huge amount of respect for, um, uh, for Anne and, and for others in, in this space. And, and I'll tell you, here, here's really the, the, the fundamental economics of the problem. It costs billions and billions of dollars to bring a drug to the market. Um, and, and we've seen just in the COVID pandemic how difficult it can be, even with tremendous focus, even with shared goals, even with pulling public and public public and private resources together, how hard it is to get to a common set of reagents that solve a common biological problem. Yeah, that's not an easy problem to solve. And, and we as a community, as a global community have been trying to do that. And I would say in pretty earnest ways, everyone's been trying to share data, everyone's trying to get it um, you know, right. And, and it's been hard, it has not been easy, right? It has not been easy in any way, shape or form. Now imagine what's going on behind the scenes with diabetes research, with cardiovascular research, it's not, easy. it's not easy work. It's, it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of dedication. And I would argue there's a massive amount of data loss and exhaust. If we could figure out how we can encapsulate data, do a far better job of tracking this, we can accelerate this process. And that's part of the logic of what 23 and is doing. Here's one of the best examples when something like this has worked, when bringing genetics to, um, to uh, bear on drug development. And this is just you know, spectacular success in bench to bread side. In, in the discovery of a set of uh, uh, drugs called PCSK9 inhibitors. These are the set of drugs you take um, if you suffer particularly from a disease called familial hypercholesterolemia. And it was found partly by studying families with that condition. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that story, the successes and actually some of the muted, muted issues that have to do with distribution of this into the market. So the, the beginnings is just really wonderful genetics. Like in any other trait, your bad cholesterol has a distribution. There are people with high cholesterol and there are people with bad cholesterol. And it turns out some people with high cholesterol have high cholesterol for genetic reasons. And one of those genetic reasons is a very particular breaking of the uh, cholesterol pathway uh, leading to what is known as familial hypercholesterolemia. This is a very extreme form of, of, of hereditary high cholesterol. It is caused by primarily three different kinds of genes or, or mutations in these three different genes. But more importantly, it's, it's actually not that rare. About one in 200 people suffer from uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And, and what's particularly worrying is the vast majority of them don't. And some of these people have a, a, a lifelong risk of cardiovascular disease that is just exorbitant. And so you really want to get them on medication very early on because it's not just about controlling diet to, to lower your, your bad cholesterol. So just to put this into perspective, um, here is the one-to-one -one line. So here's everybody who um, you know, doesn't have familial hypercholesterolemia and their you know, sort of average cholesterol profile. If you happen to carry one mutation in this gene, uh, you know, so you inherited one, one allele from say mom or dad, then by the time you're my age, you would have the, the lipid profile of somebody in their 60s. And, and if you were, you know, really, uh, you know, unfortunately to have uh, gotten two, two alleles, you were homozygous FH, then actually by the time you're a teenager, you have the, the lipid profile of somebody in their 60s. And so you really, really want to get ahead of this. And this is a, a, a condition that is a, a real poster child for parental health. If we can get people on medication early, we can literally save their lives. So um, the, the wonderful thing about this is that it's also been a treasure trove for linking genetics to drug development and, and biomarkers. So several, now 15 years ago, the, the brilliant team of Helen Hobbs and Jonathan Cohen and colleagues um, demonstrated that in one of these genes where you have high cholesterol, if you have overexpression of the gene, PCSK9, there were people that through just random chance were born with a broken version of the gene. 
Okay, so high PCSK9 leads to high cholesterol. Broken PCSK9, what happens? Well, it turns out broken PCSK9 turns to be, turns out to be, you know, winning the genetic lottery. You shift, you, you literally have by genetics, far less cholesterol. Your, your set point for cholesterol is, is just reduced. And that's just a wonderful gift from God. All right, great. Now, does this actually translate clinically? Absolutely. Not only are you protected with lower cholesterol, but in fact, that lower cholesterol translates into reduced incidence of, of coronary heart disease. And this was just massively, massively interesting. They found this in a multi-ethnic study, including African Americans and 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 European um, uh, American patients, and so this was just you know heralded as, as great success, and and now we can turn the crank and we can do more of this. So great, what, what's the problem? Well, when this drug first went to market, they were trying to charge twelve thousand dollars a year for it. Third of Americans have high cholesterol. You're not going to put a third of Americans on a drug that costs twelve thousand dollars a year. You can't. The, the system won't afford it. So. And this is a problem that, of course, you, you deal with all the time in, in, in the UK. It's a question of how do you reallocate resources and you have a certain amount of, of purchasing and, and, and you think very hard about how you allocate those resources. That's very different than in the United States, which is let's put drugs out on the market and figure out, you know, once they've met, you know, clinical uh, improvement criteria, how we finance them. I mean, that really is the, the, the kind of difference. And in this case, I think they, they basically got the business model wrong. You know, they, they um, didn't target um, what should have been targeted, which is, the, you know, really these patients that have um, cholesterol uh, from an early age with a biomarker, uh, because most of these patients are not known. And so it is not surprising that when you go out and you try to get these patients on the drug, the insurance says, hey, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the evidence. And, and this is part of the problem. So, so he, here is um, you know, recommendations from the FH Foundation, a, a group that's set up to, to, to help find cures and, and um, improve the quality of lives of patients with FH. And, and they would recommend that everybody basically get screened very early for, for FH, particularly, you know, if both mom and dad have FH, we should do, definitely be screening the child for FH and, and potentially starting them on statin as early as eight or nine years old. You have to be very aggressive in some of these cases. And if you don't you know, know about the parents, maybe you, you um, screen when they're going into school or when they're, you know, exiting, you know, school or going into the military or, or college or something. And so, you know, we should be screening much earlier. That's the point. The average age at which somebody is diagnosed with FH is, is close to 50 and they've already been on lipid lowering therapy for several years. So, so they've already gotten, you know, disease. Some, some of them have already had an early heart attack or stroke and, and this could have literally been avoided. So, um, and, and again, this, this is really the, just the statistics. The vast majority of patients prescribed with PCSK9 are denied. Okay, there's 95% are denied the first time, 62% are eventually denied. Um, and this is true whether they're a, a presumptive FH patient or a high risk for the vessel disease patient. That is not true of additional therapies that would be added on top of statins, um, you know, simply because they're, they're pretty cheap. And so it's, it's easy to make that decision. And so, you know, why does this happen? Well, the, why this happens is because the United States has just transformed from spending about 5% of GDP to close to 20 plus percent of GDP on, on healthcare. And, and, you know, th this is actually, you know, uh, under reporting to the 2010, the, the, the interesting question is the left of courtesy of this, and this has not actually changed. So healthcare systems extraordinarily left to critic. The top 1% of claimants eat 22% of the pie. The top 5% of claimants eat 5% of the pie. So we're paying $10,000 per man, woman, and child in, in the country, yet half of Americans use less than $1,000 in healthcare. And this is where you'd have to get that money for preventative cardiovascular disease care and FH patients, and it just doesn't exist. So you, you wait until they get sick and there's plenty of money to take care of them in the acute care system. And that's just really what many, many, many people have been trying to figure out how to fight against. And I would argue what's different about my solution. Um, and and it's, it's simply to say that I, I view this as a, a supply chain optimization problem. And, and it's really simply about bringing data to bear on the problem. You know, there's just extraordinary waste of information because the systems are simply designed to build. And, and so if you want to have different results, you have to build different systems. And, and I would argue as much as I've 
you know, been and, and continue to be and will always be an advocate for um, machine learning and methods and, and, and you know, build departments on this. These become, as we know, tactical weapons. These are not strategy. These are how we solve a problem. These don't tell us what problem to go solve. Okay, and, and so for all of you who are interested in ethics and AI and, and how you really reframe this, you know, we can get these systems to be magic. We've seen magic. Now the magic you produce really depends on the spells you want to enchant. And what are the spells you want to enchant? And that's the fundamental question. What direction do you want to take this? And so I want to just highlight two groups that I think are doing brilliant work. It's not my research, but I think it's just brilliant, brilliant work. The first is the work out of Vanderbilt. Um, and, and I've for years been on the record saying that two of my very favorite people in the whole world are Josh Denny and, and Lisa Bastaracci, because I think they've done just, just pioneering work in this space. And, and they have an algorithm called VRS, which basically does magic. It goes through the EHR and it finds patients with presumptive Mendelian diseases. And, you know, I really recommend you read their paper. Here's really the logic. You can stream code and think about, is this patient likely to be a patient with cystic fibrosis or a patient not with cystic fibrosis? And because they had genotyped everybody in their representative system of, of the Vanderbilt healthcare system, they can basically ask, what kind of resources does a cystic fibrosis patient utilize versus control? Sure enough, after a while, you've seen enough code to de demonstrate, you know, you know, it looks like a CF patient. You can go back and validate. Well, it turns out they demonstrated massive, you know, I would say, you know, under under um, reporting of, of of true disease patients. So they had, you know, 25%, you know, under reporting of cystic fibrosis patients that they now found marked ancestral mitochondrial It's really quite striking. What's also really interesting is that the exception that proves the rule is phenylketonuria or PKU. And the reason is that everybody gets their advice from the back of a Coke can for PKU, and we have universal screening from birth very early on for PKU. So even if you have PKU, you don't present like a patient with PKU because we've, you know, we've prevented that disease largely, or in many ways, we've done a great job of beginning to prevent that disease because of the way we put people on special diets and screeners and whatnot. We've done something very similar at Stanford, and by we, I mean Josh Knowles and Nigam Shaw. Again, I just want to highlight their, their brilliant work on this and in collaboration with the FH. Uh, foundation. They've built something called Find FH. And again, it's, it's really their research. I encourage you to take a look at it. But the, the goal was to take and um, use a disparate set of clinical notes, conditions, procedures, and build a, um, a classifier based on FH patients from Stanford, cross-validate with outside healthcare systems, and demonstrate that, you know, based on the richness of the data, you could clearly separate FH from non-FH patients. And of course, that works. And they then scaled this out and with the FH Foundation created what I think is, is the sort of future here, a synthetic map of where the FH patients are and how you might be able to access them. In fact, they made this available through a doctor portal so that if you are a patient and you have a, 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 a practice, sorry, if you're, if you're a doctor and you have a practice and would like to see who your presumptive FH patients are, you could actually go to the website and, and, and dig in and, and look at that. So you know, I do think this is the future. I think this is exactly what we need to do. I, I would also argue in some sense that the smartest people at Stanford couldn't take a bunch of data and find presumptive FH patients would be in a lot of trouble in, 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 in our country. So um, I'm, I'm really you know, glad that, that this works. And I would also argue that I think this is ripe for disruptive technology. So and I've been saying this for a while, two years ago, Color partnered with, um, with the FH Foundation, Color, is a company out of San Francisco that's doing a lot of population genomic sequencing. They've now actually pivoted and or not pivoted, they've added a ton of COVID testing. So these companies have actually got set up to do population sequencing in this context or now pivoting in, in that same national need. And in fact, I would argue disrupting, you know, our, our, our own um, uh, healthcare delivery as well. In this context, color, you know, built an FH um, test that they're able to do for 200 bucks. So, you know, here you go, right? Like this is, you know, the smartest folks at Stanford and the startup of very smart people can, you know, pretty much do something that it used to take, you know, the, the, the best in, in, in class to do. And, and I think that's wonderful. This is happening all the time. And, and Clay Christensen, the late Clay Christensen, 
you know, wrote an, an incredible book on this. And of course, this harkens back to Schumpeter and, and, and the whole notion that technology is a, a replenishing cycle, right? And, 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 and the notion here is that you have a, uh, a product that has, um, you know, split um, market. So this is the high end of the market. This is the low end of the market. And the low end of the market in the beginning just looks like a toy. It's just not all that great, but it gets faster, better, cheaper. And it eventually supplants the existing technology. And so the innovator's dilemma is that once you become the established technology, it becomes very hard to, to stay there. And so, um, and, and of course, the classic example now is actually cell phones overtaking landlines, right? You can say jump, jump to landline, you know, jump, jump to cell phones. It's actually interesting to see, at least in in, in um, US, you know, it was not until like 2015 that you actually overtook you know, having, you know, only a, a cell phone over a landline, right? So you still have a period when, when you have the, the old technology, but, but the new technology begin, begins to overtake quickly. Um, I, I would argue this is what's gonna happen to, to, to a lot of testing in healthcare delivery. I think we are in right for disruption. I, I wanna absolutely disrupt our tertiary and quaternary care. I would love nothing more than to have far fewer um, intensive care needs um, due to chronic disease. I'd much rather prevent all that stuff in the future based on putting people on the right medication at the right schedule tailored to their biology. And, and many folks, of, of course, want to see that world happen. I think the, the key is that it's not going to happen. It's on. It will only happen if we incentivize in the right direction. And that's a, that's a joint decision we will make among policymakers, investors, and, and, and what you incentivize. Um, this is a cliche at this point. We, we all know that the world's most valuable resource is, is no longer oil, but data. In fact, oil has become toxic waste. Um, and, and I would argue when I was a child, um, oil companies were, of course, the most um, revered and, and best um, in the whole wide world. I was born in Venezuela. And um, we thought of, um, you know, the, the, the automotive industry and, and the fossil fuel industry as just the center of, of the economy. And they were the biggest companies in the world in, in the world until they got overtaken by the tech companies that are today the biggest companies in the world. And I would argue the biggest companies in 20 to 30 years are not going to be tech companies. They'll be wet, dry companies. They'll be companies that are doing bio at scale, no doubt in my mind. And I think it begins with marrying the things we're doing now on data into the things that are happening in what um, what Peter Thiel has called atoms in the world of atoms. We're good in the world of bits. We haven't had a lot of innovation in the world of atoms. And I would say you're just beginning to see innovation in the world of cells. And, and so bio will take off. And so this becomes you know, part of where the, the, you're, you're really going to transform this from happening at universities into happening in industry at scale. Um, and, and part of this is just simply economics. Apple has so much cash on hand. Microsoft has so much cash on hand that they have no choice but to go after these industries. And this was several years ago. They've, they've already more than telegraphed their plays. They've, they've become massive entrants in, into the healthcare, not only the healthcare consumer space, but, but I would argue beginning hard, hard into the health, healthcare delivery space soon. Um, and, and this is beginning with smart devices um, that then also become research devices. And, and, and now you're beginning to see why you know, the, the, the hospital systems don't really stand a chance. The, 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 you know, the data has already left the building. You can get all the data on your phones. It's all protocolized. This was part of the incentive of the Obama and, and Bush administrations of, of really pushing forward a digitization of, of healthcare in the early 2000s, and early 2010s. And you're just reaping that plus the, you know, the, the obvious market hotness of the last four or five years have just extraordinarily exploded, you know, the, the, the innovation in this space. Um, I, I would argue the next that's happening is all digital tracking of biology. Uh, there's a company that, that I followed for a while called Inside Tracker that was doing this kind of um, following of your bio. I think in, in the context of COVID, we're going to really reinvent a ton of this again, um, in, in particular focused on the immune system and digitizing the immune system and getting all the streams to, to, to come in. So expect all of these layered omics to, to be part of, of, of what gets brought in with what ultimately has to be some way of authenticating all this and, and living systems for who has access to what kind of data. So this is one example of a, of a kind of health coin that could be produced where there's a plan made between a doctor and an individual, and that includes a shared ledger that accumulates information. And again, th this is now in some sense old hat to, to many of you. Many of you already know far more about 
um, fintech and, and verticalizing exchange of information and smart contracts, um, that will all come into play. It will come into my heart when it comes to healthcare. Absolutely hard. It, it has to. There's, there's no question about it. And um, the, the really interesting um, direction, you know, is, is to what degree are patients able to control this? And, and I think um, the EU's led with, with a lot on GDPR and putting folks at the center of, of, of controlling their data. Um, I think that, that um, has been incredibly important. I also think that um, you're going to have just generational shifts, you know, as, as more and more um, of the world's population is far more technology literate than those that um, are writing policy, then you're just going to reshape this whole world. So it's exciting. I, I think it's also going to be just a lot of disruption. Um, and, and there's just massive, massive, massive amounts of money at stake. I mean, I think that's part of the issue. So here's an example of a therapy. If you thought $12,000 was expensive, here's a um, just a spectacular cure for blindness. Literally magic. It's $850,000. Um, there's a spark therapeutic company that's actually already been acquired. Um, it, you know, how do you, you know, the vast majority of Americans will never make you know, like, how are they, how are they going to pay for that, right? So um, the, the question is um, one of incentivizing systems. So what, what have these guys done? They've been extraordinarily smart. The distribution channel is tiny. You can't just go get Luxterna anywhere. It is a surgery and it's a surgery that's administered with a payment back guarantee. So if there aren't improvements 30 to 90 days and, or, or over 30 months, then you can claw back the payment. So, you know, I kind of like that and, and imagine more of that, you know, being at, at the heart of this. Um, but, but it gets even more expensive. So um, again, this is you know, from a year ago, uh, Zolgensma was um, an eye popping $2 million in terms of how much it was gonna cost for a therapy. And all of these are of course vaccines in many ways, you know? And so as the world is now learning to vaccinate against COVID and learning to create vaccinations at scale, we will of course begin to vaccinate against all kinds of things, including rare diseases and more common diseases. So there are now PCSK9 injectable um, that are better than the first generation, right? So instead of having to go every week, you go every six months, and then there'll also be PCSK9 that you take once and it you know, transforms your liver. So um, that's not gonna be cheap, but it will be made available. And it becomes this question of who pays and who's got access. And I think, again, it's going to be an exciting world. It's one where we're going to have to ask a lot of questions and, and the data is going to be key. And, and maybe I'll leave with this um, kind of exciting, I, I thought, kind of forward looking paper from, from Andrew Lowe and others on um, systems for these kind of very expensive um, therapies, which, which basically become mortgages on, on, on the on, the payments to the, you know back to the companies, and and I think at that point you begin to see where at, at some point the system just you know has to really rethink how this all goes. <laughs> you know you you can't continue to you know, just ratchet ratchet up that price without having not only the obvious outcomes to back it up, but but just a a, a realization of, of the massive 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 need to reduce the cost of all this, which of course will happen. I mean you know you. you um, saw it in the tech industry, you saw it in the devices industry, you know, you're seeing it now in logistics, you know, this all becomes um, really a question of time and, and how these technologies become translated. Uh, I, I do think that Bill made a very important point in, in his book, which is that it can't go on if you don't continue the three-player game. And, and I do agree with that. I, I think that if we try to be radical in one direction or another, right, either, you know, it has to all be, you know, state funding or it has to be the opposite, right? You got to reduce state funding and let, you know, the, um, the private industry pick up the, the, the bulk of research, you're, you're going to incentivize, you know, just, just vastly different outcomes. And so getting that balance right, I think, is the, at the forefront of where much of what we need to do over the coming 2020s lies. Um, I think COVID in particular 
um, has one silver lining, which is that it will fortify so much of what we do in healthcare delivery just just by the just the tragic nature of what we're all living through. Um, and it will also just soberly, I think, make it clear to many of us how important it is to share our data, how to make that available, how um, just difficult so much of this is. Things that seem easy are really, really hard, and they're particularly hard to do and do at scale. So bringing it back to the motivating question, particularly of how do you now take this and add a dimension of some of the sickest people aren't even in the databases, right? So this has put aside almost the motivating question of how do we now go and take all of this incredible technology that's been built and make it available to the sickest of the sick? And in my opinion, I, I think um, that is going to be the, the fundamental challenge. I, I think market solutions will take us so far. I think people will subscribe, people will and have subscribed in, in the 23andMe setting. Uh, but at some point, I think this really does become a, a question of balancing that three player game. And it'll swing in, the, in, 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 I think, the direction of just massive, massive needs of, um, of institutional investment um, by all sides. I, I think uh, pharma will need to invest hard in, in building new infrastructure. Um, it won't come just from the government, but I think a lot of it will need to be audited and, and followed in, in ways that we can all be comfortable about the results. I think that's the real challenge right now. The, the data that's flowing, not a lot of people have a lot of faith in what they're getting, and that's hard. And, and that makes it really difficult to make progress. And so the um, work we are doing as data scientists in pulling infrastructure together, while at times may seem disparate and, 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 and hard to pull together in the fog of war, I think will be some of the most important work we'll do over the coming years. Just because I think this is the basis of creating a new, hopefully fairer, and ideally far more innovative healthcare system that can benefit everybody, right? It has to be able to translate those results far faster and far better and far cheaper so that we can all benefit. So with that, I wanna thank you for, for the opportunity to speak today. I'm um, honored to be here and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.